Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Energy Access Relief Fund Help Desk Workshop on the Google Consumer Protection Code. My name is Dennis Migono, and I will be uh, your host for this workshop. I am a communications associate at CLASP, and I'm joined by my colleague, Monica Mboui, uh, Park uh, Van Basten, and uh, Rebecca Rhodes, who I will introduce later on. Uh, before we begin, I would like to go over a few house rules for your convenience. One, today's session is being recorded, and that recording will be available on the CLASP YouTube channel for your viewing. Uh, two, all attendees are currently muted uh, to allow for a smooth flow of the presentation. However, participants may unmute uh, during the question and answer sessions or during the discussion segments that we'll be having later on. If you have any questions for the panelists, uh, please drop it in the chat or you could send that directly to me um, as a direct message. You can also use the raise your hand feature um, and I will give you an opportunity to speak. We encourage you to share information freely and to respect the diversity of opinions that will be expressed throughout this session. Uh, finally, a certificate of participation will be issued to all the attendees. Um, so I will give instructions on how to ensure that you get your certificate at the end of the session. Our facilitators for today are uh, Rebecca Rhodes. Rebecca is a senior project manager at Google. We also have with us uh, Park Van Basten, Junior Project Manager at Google. Uh, Rebecca and Park uh, work in Google's consumer protection team, where they lead uh, consumer protection, circularity, as well as performance and investment initiatives. But before we hear from them, um, I invite my colleague, Monica Omboi, who leads the implementation of the Energy Access Relief Fund Help Desk at CLASP, to give opening remarks. Monica, welcome. Thanks, Dennis, and hello, everyone, and welcome again. Um, as Dennis mentioned, my name is Monica Wamboi, and I work with CLASP uh, based in our Nairobi office, and I'm uh, very excited to be here. And so today um, we are on, um, I think, workshop number seven, uh, where we're focusing on the Google Consumer Protection Code. And so just a bit about the in a, the Energy Access Relief Fund Help Desk. So the Energy Access Relief Fund um, was, is a fund that was put together by the World Bank and the Help Desk was created to support the applicants and borrowers of this fund to build the capacity around topics uh, around, on topics around um, the uh, ESMS, so the Environmental Social Management Systems, as well as e-waste. And so the fund is being managed by CIMA. However, the Help Desk was set up and has been set up to focus on a couple of topics. Um, it's focusing on e-waste management, it's focusing on uh, developing the foundational aspects of ESMS, um, thinking about stakeholder engagement, what are the labor and working conditions when you're thinking about um, how, and how does it fit into ESMS, as well as the foundational aspects of sustainable supply chains, and finally the Google Consumer Protection Code. And so the, the help desk is working in several ways. We have the, these workshops that have been running on a um, sort of monthly basis. And so here we just do a deep dive on each of these topics and just um, understand them even better. But we also have a portal where we have housed, we not only house these recordings as well as the presentations, but we also house a number of other resources, both on environmental social management systems as well as e-waste. And then finally, we also have one-on-one -on -one, um, capacity building sessions. And, and it's at this point that I invite you to reach out to us um, to, we have a dedicated email address, the ARF helpdesk at class.ngo, and you can reach out to us with any specific questions on, on the listed topics that I just mentioned in case um, upon review of the resources and as well as having watched the recordings that you still have additional questions, we are available to you for any questions that you may have and ready to engage. Yes, but on to today's workshop on the consumer protection code. Um, I think it's, I'm very excited to be here and just um, learn more and just engage on why consumer protection and the role that consumer protection plays in mitigating against consumer exposure to product, product finance and service risk. 
And just basically, how do you protect the rights of the consumer? And finally, how do you safeguard um, the positive impact yeah, of all the work that, 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 that you get to do? And so I guess we'll be understanding how what the consumer protection code is. How do you make a commitment as, a, as an organization? And how can you also use the tools that then have been made available through Google to understand where you're at and how you can improve your business? So looking forward to it, I, I expect it to be a very interactive session because um, there was a, um, the invitation to just review the projection code as well as carry out the self-assessment. And so we hope that you had a chance to do that. And we hope that um, you're coming into this with multiple questions and that uh, we have the Rebecca and Perk present to just answer all of them and that it, this will be useful. So thank you so much and welcome Rebecca and Perk. Hi, um, thanks Monica and thanks Dennis uh, for the introductions. Yeah, so um, without further ado, I'll, I'll make a start on the, the topic of today, which is consumer protection for um, off-grid solar consumers. So Puck, if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we'll um, go through just a, a little bit of general overview of of why consumer protection is important in the industry and really why you know this is a requirement in the the earth fund um, because i think it's it's just you know key to understanding um of the the next steps as well so um and then we'll look at the the consumer protection code itself how you can use the assessment framework uh, within your business and then some good practice for companies that have been identified from um, other companies that have already kind of implemented it and are quite uh, far down their consumer protection journey as well. Um, so yeah, Puck, if you would like to go. Uh, next, we've already had the housekeeping, I think. So I think we're good. Uh, and again, um, okay, so I would just recap the what actually is stated on consumer protection in the um, ESMS of the Energy Access Relief Fund. So for off-grid solar providers, um, so this is companies that are distributing SHS, Pico Lanterns, solar water pumps and such like. So they are required to make a commitment to the Goggler Consumer Protection Code. For other companies, um, so this can include kind of mini grid developers or companies that focus more on, on cook stove. They, the Goggler Consumer Protection Code doesn't really apply because we designed it for the off-grid solar sector. However, the principles are still very, very relevant. And so within the ESMS, um, I think the phrasing is that those companies shall agree on similar uh, consumer protection principles that align with the, the Goggler Consumer Protection Code. Um, and this could be done by, you know, adopting those principles into your organizational code of conduct, making sure that um, the principles are kind of outlined through employee training um, and, you know, building it into your own ESMS as well. Um, borrowers of all kinds are required to use the self-assessment tool to measure and monitor their consumer protection practices. Um, and so some of you may have already been through this um, as part of the application process. Some might be just doing it now, um, but then it's also to be done uh, biannually um, for the duration of the loan. Um, but also as Goggler, we, we do also recommend that companies do this at least once a year um, regardless to, to help you kind of really integrate consumer protection into your internal management systems. Um, so next slide, please. And again. So why, why is consumer protection important? So everyone on the line knows that the off-grid solar sector and energy access products improve the lives of consumers. Um, you know, they bring social impact, economic impact and um, environmental impacts as well. Um, but on the other hand, consumers are exposed to new types of product, financial and service risks that they might not have been um, exposed to before. And this is particularly the case with pay as you go business models um, on the financial side. 
but the same is there for a product. If even if a customer pays uh, for a product in cash, they do not want that product to break down, you know, within a matter of months and they are, you know, back to, to where they started. Um, and so the Consumer Protection Code really ensures that a company's growth objectives remain fully aligned with the consumer interests. So alongside that, it also shows and demonstrates to customers that you're a responsible business. Investors know that you're kind of have the customer's best interests at heart um, and other stakeholders as well really kind of um, can get on board with your sort of mission and consumer centric approach as well. Um, next slide, please. So when Gogler first started looking at consumer protection, we um, we did a study, we went out um, and listened to um, a number of, of customers of off-grid solar products from different markets. Um, and I've just sharing here just a couple of, um, of stories from, from two of those that kind of demonstrate the need for good consumer protection practice. Um, so first we've got NEMA. Um, Nima runs a small shop and supports her younger brother in college. She's had a solar system for um, 18 months. And after 12 months of repay, making regular payments, her uncle fell ill. And so, as is so often the case uh, with the, the consumers that we serve, she and her family pooled their resources to pay for his medical treatments. Um, but then unfortunately he passed away and the family had also to pay for his funeral expenses. And this could put pressure on her finances. And so she fell behind on her payments for the SHS. Um, as a defaulting customer, she was contacted by the solar company and they, after discussing the problem with her, they kind of rescheduled the, the payment plan um, and a, enabled her to, to continue paying, continue benefiting from the product, uh, but reduced the payments uh, by 20% and extended the loan term. So since then, um, you know, the, the payment plan was adjusted to her evolving circumstances and she was able to continue to enjoy the product. So here, I think, a, an example of, of good consumer protection uh, in place. Next slide, please, Buck. And on the um, the other side, so not so good an outcome in, in this situation. So Mary, an elderly woman who lives with her husband, um, also purchased a solar home system. She trusted the agent who sold it to her. Um, because even though she thought she could not afford the system, the agent convinced her um, and encouraged her to get as much money as she can and they'll work something out for the future. So she, after trusting the agent, she did this. Um, she kind of had the system in her home, but soon ran out of money because she wasn't aware that the payments were so high um, and eventually led to her defaulting and having the system repossessed. So Mary said she felt embarrassed. She was ashamed of not being able to keep up with her debts. And she lost the light that she had uh, started to kind of love and, and changed her life. So this company had exposed her to, to debt that she wasn't able to, to manage. And that's through kind of poor training of the agent, perhaps. Um, a badly incentivized agent as well. And um, so here as well, just demonstrating that uh, consumer protection is kind of cross-cutting and we need to look at it um, through all of our interactions with consumers. If we go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so really just open it up in case um, anyone has any similar stories to share from their own experience feel free to unmute and share or um, pop it in the, the chat as well. So do these stories really resonate with your experiences? You know, do you have systems in place to deal with similar uh, situations? 
Um, and can you kind of change uh, any of your, your existing processes? All right, so I've uh, unmuted all the participants. So if you'd like to share, uh, please go ahead and, and share. Okay, I see uh, Wiza, you've unmuted. Do you have an experience to share? Do these uh, stories um, resonate with you? Yes. Um, um, as the way I've heard the stories, the way they've been represented, it's like um, it's a common thing with uh, each and every company that is doing uh, the solar business in terms of uh, when it's done via um, Bago. Hello. And, um, so, sorry about that. Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to speak, Bella, uh, once we up. Uh, finishes proceed with that. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we've had such experiences that um, the customers likes like uh, here we used to say solar home systems, and uh, you sell them, and after that they fail to pay. So there are situations where we do negotiate with the customers uh, on how they can service their loans instead of. Uh, us repossessing the um, their kit, but uh, somehow the only problem that we face is sometimes when you do like the way uh, the first scenario, they uh, rescheduled uh, the loan. You find it hard sometimes, like here in Malawi, you find out that uh, those people instead of honoring the new agreement, they don't honor. So maybe on that, on what can the companies change or continue doing, I would need a help on how we can uh, solve the problems like that. Because uh, usually we don't like um, giving the product to customers after some time and then taking them off. Um, yeah. All right, and um, about the, the, revised debt, the revised debt servicing plan, uh, what has been the success rate? Is it that all the customers default when you negotiate with them or some of them uh, actually honor the new agreement? Uh, most of the times they prefer the new ones, but um, yeah. now it comes to the same problems that uh, they fail to honor the agreement. So, you know, usually yeah. when you're doing this, uh, uh, the off grid usually the longer distances for the company you know, to reach such areas. So yeah. it becomes like okay. a, a, a draining of resources is for the company. Yeah. So it's like the best way is just to repossess so that if the customer is uh, willing to take uh, to continue, they can come again and uh, take their kit, but also it has its own risks. And also in right. terms of protecting the customer, uh, the consumer protection code as the way you've presented, it's like it is being breached somehow. Yeah, so I, uh, I think it's, okay. just add to that, I think I agree it's a very kind of challenging um, situation that, that I think companies are, are in, to be honest. And a lot of times, um, it's not easy to distinguish between a customer's willingness to pay and their ability to pay. Um, so I think from a company's perspective, um, there's a lot that could be done upfront in terms of the, um, the information that we share with customers upfront before they've made the purchase, um, how we do the, the credit uh, risk assessment so making sure that they have the ability to pay and um, you know they're not picking a, a product that's too expensive for them and leaving them kind of no wiggle room in their finances for um, for unexpected kind of financial shocks um, and making sure that we're just kind of selling appropriate products for them um, but yeah again some you know sometimes we cannot avoid 
a customer going into default um, and ultimately needing to to repossess. And I think so. We're we're not saying that that that's not necessarily the right thing to do, um, but it's it's just what can companies do upfront to to avoid that yeah. further down down the line. Um, and again, the um, I think if we go to the next slide, Puck, I might have something. Yeah, so um, just just kind of summarizes a few of the consumer protection risks here. So um, the kind of treatment from agents, um, product quality and service risk, over indebtedness. So that that's really what we're talking around uh, there and also end of life product risk. So what happens uh, when that product breaks? But the point I want to make here is just on the, the bottom here. So some of the insights that we have from um, studies and uh, research that we've done in this area is that there's a really strong correlation between customer satisfaction. So that's the, the net promoter score, the customer repayment rates and their product challenge rates. So how frequently a customer might experience a technical issue with um, their product. So essentially, you know, nobody's going to pay for something that doesn't work or if they're receiving a bad service or they are not happy with the, the payment terms. Um, and so a company, you know, really kind of doing as much as it can to, to treat customers well actually has better outcomes itself. Um, because they have better repayment rates, better portfolio quality, and lower rates of uh, default. So that's what we're starting to see um, as we get more and more data from across the, the sector there. Um, any more comments or questions before we um, dig into to everything? Yeah, we also have a, a poll here as well, um, if we could launch that at the same time. So this is um, asking the biggest risk to consumers of energy access products are either the financial risk, the product risk, a service risk, um, the risk of poor treatment from agents or you know, no risk at all. Or if there's anything else, just pop it in the chat. Um, and this is just your opinion, just kind of collecting. All right, so we've launched the poll. Uh, please take a moment to respond. Um, okay. Uh, we have 30% respond, so waiting on the others to, okay. Okay, so uh, please respond to the question if you haven't so that we can end the poll and proceed to the next. Uh, the question is, what is the uh, biggest risk to consumers of energy access products? And this is our multiple choice question, so uh, you can pick more than one response. All right, so I'll end the poll uh, and share the results. Uh, there we go, Rebecca, are you able to see that? Yes, thank you, yep. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, so I think very much the, the financial risks kind of picked out there as everybody agrees with that. And most also agreeing with um, the the risk through agent-based sales net networks. I think that that's a particular challenge that companies face um, and the yeah. service risk um, as well. Yeah, we also have uh, Eva in the comments uh, who says the biggest risk can be covered by the insurance. Mm -hmm. And I think that is um, a comment. Yep. Do, would you like to share uh, a little bit more about that, Eva? And um, yeah, Eva, if you're able to just unmute and uh, explain some more.
Eva, are you able to? Not sure speak? if she's able. Actually, I don't see a, a microphone uh, next yeah, to her yeah. name in the list. Um, yeah. So uh, I agree. There's there are new kind of insurance products also coming through um, in the sector, but again, they they also bring with it their own risk about. Um, the transparency of making sure that consumers are aware that they are paying for insurance, how and when they can claim on that insurance, um, and you know that, that they're fully educated about that insurance uh, product. Um, and it's that is actually an area that um, we are hoping to work more on as Goggler in the next uh, couple of years as well as more insurance-based products um, emerge. Okay, Puck, do you want to? So Puck, um, I'll hand over to Puck now and she will take you through the kind of the, the fundamentals of the, the consumer protection code. Yes, hello, good to, to, uh, to have you all today. So indeed I'll take you to the, to the key elements of the code and uh, the practicals of how you can make a commitment to it. Um, but first, um, we do have another question to see um, where everyone's at, um, who is in the room. So Dennis, if you would be so kind to launch the poll, then we can see um, which one of the companies that we have in the room have already made a commitment to the Consumer Protection Code. Um, so maybe you do have a commitment um, or you don't, and maybe you're not sure whether your company has already made a commitment to the code. So. Um, we just like to see, um, yeah, where everyone's at um, with regards to to the code. All right, so we've uh, launched the poll. Uh, please take a moment to respond. Okay, seems uh, like we don't have any more responses. I'll give a few seconds to anyone who's trying to do that right now okay hopefully the question isn't too hard to answer <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah uh, so we're getting more responses so maybe that that should be a signal that it's not such a difficult question um a few more seconds 15 more seconds for anyone who's trying to answer right now and then we'll end the poll Okay, so I'll end the poll now and share the results. Go. Ah, okay. Um, well, really good to see that um, quite a few of you have already made a, a made a commitment. Um, and it's also interesting to see that some of you are not sure whether your company has made a commitment. And I think this is something we'll, we'll see later on um, and hopefully encourage you to um, to have a commitment to the code as something that everyone in the company is aware of and um, yeah, is really aligned with the principles. Um, so this is a good start to, to get going. Um, yeah, let's, let's dive um, into the code. So um, as Rebecca said, there are um, yeah, quite a few of risks to consumers in, in our sector. And um, together with the, the Consumer Protection Working Group, we have been um, creating the code that consists of six principles. And these principles um, aim to address the full range of these risks. Um, and you can see them here. So we have transparency at the top, um, responsible sales and pricing, good consumer service, good product quality, um, personal data privacy and fair and respectful treatment. Um, and the code is focused on the pay go model um, as some, yeah, some financial risks are a bit higher with that model, but it is also accommodated for, for cash sales. So it really is applicable to a whole range of um, business models. And as I said, together with the Consumer Protection Working Group that now consists of nearly 60 members, um, the code was defined so that it really covers the, um, yeah, the, the, the needs and the, the thoughts of the industry. It was created by the industry to serve the industry. 
Um, and it is as well maintained by this working group. So if there are any changes that need to be incorporated, uh, we try to do this with, with the working group to make sure it is um, still relevant and, and adequate at every moment. And I'd like to give you a short example. Well, we know that some in the room might already be aware um, of the principles and the indicators, but I think it's good to just quickly go through them to see um, what a principle looks like. Um, and I think the um, yeah the challenge what with um, developing these principles and indicators was really to find the right balance so that it wouldn't be overly prescriptive for companies, but so that it was still meaningful and adequate. Um, and of course, had the, the consumer's needs at, um, at highest interest. So here we see the principle of transparency that has three main elements that says that the company should, um, should always share clear and sufficient information on a bunch of um, 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 sorry, characteristics, so product service, as well as the payment plan, personal data privacy practices. And this is all to make sure that the consumers can make informed decisions. Then it's important that the company um, shares relevant and timely information, um, not only before the sale, but as well during and after the sale. And then as you, yeah, um, we know that some um, consumers in the industry might um, have low literacy levels or um, we have uh, countries in which many uh, languages are spoken so that it's important that the company communicates in a language and a manner. So for example, by using visual aids um, so that um, all the consumers can understand um, the, the information that is shared. Well, an example of an indicator. So there in total, there are 37 indicators for each of the six principles. Um, here we see number one indicator for the transparency principle that says consumers are informed of um, key terms and conditions of the contract. Um, and again, stating what it should include. So for example, the duration, um, as well as the sanctions for late and non-payment um, and some other things. And as COCLA, we encourage um, all members, um, first of all, to explore um, how the code can, can add value to, to their businesses or organization and eventually, or an endorsement of the code. Um, and what the difference is between a commitment and an endorsement. So a commitment is, is for all um, off-grid solar providers. Um, as I said, it covers a range of, of different business models. Um, but the main thing is that it is for companies that really have consumer-facing operations. Whilst an endorsement is mainly, for example, for investors or other industry stakeholders, and then it shows that they align with, um, with the principles of the code or um, and slash or that they support um, the off-grid solar providers, um, for example, in their portfolio, as we, um, as we see um, as well uh, with some investors in the industry. Um, and as I said, we, we encourage all members um, to make a commitment, but the, the Consumer Protection Code is also open for non-members of COCLA. So um, we actually encourage everyone in the industry to, to make a commitment to the code if it's, uh, if it's applicable. Yeah, and I think um, Rebecca's introduction already touched upon um, several aspects of why you should make a commitment to the code. But here again, we have um, summarized some of the, the main benefits that we see um, yeah, for companies that have made a commitment. And um, yeah, first of all, treating your customers well and, and making sure that their, their needs are met um, helps to, to protect your reputation and, and to build trust um, with customers. 
and as you might be aware in in um remote areas um customer referrals are um are an important marketing tool so um yeah that that really helps then um on the other hand we see that um um, it shows to investors that you you do carry out responsible business practices, and we also see that um, some investors, even more and more, um, have it as a requirement in their in their due diligence processes to have a commitment to the code. Um, so it will help companies to increase their their investor uh, attractiveness. Then as well, um, good standards of consumer protection, um, as Rebecca said, they, they ensure consumer satisfaction and they protect repayment rates and therefore help improve portfolio quality. And yeah, as, as was explained already, um, we do see more and more um, that good consumer protection practices are correlated to indeed higher net promoter scores and higher repayment rates. So, um, it will help you to, um, yeah, to have sustainable growth in your company. Then from, from the Gokla side more, um, as I said, we do have the Consumer Protection Working Group. And here we, we bring members together to share, to learn, to explore um, best practices and insights from the industry. And we also um, are always in the run for developing more resources to, um, to share learnings and good practices as well. For example, over the last year, we have um, developed a briefing note on data privacy and transparency. Um, so how can you make sure that these principles are, um, um, are met and what you can do as a company to um, yeah, to reinforce that. Then on the practical side, how can you actually make a commitment to the code? Um, first of all, we, um, yeah, we encourage you to take an internal review of um, how your company is aligning with the spirit of the principles. Um, this can be either from the company side or from, um, as I said, if you make an endorsement um, from, the, from the investor side, then it's important to send a letter of commitment that is signed by a director of your company to Gokla. There's a template online. Um, the, shares will, the slides will be shared so you can find um, the links as well. But then making a commitment is an important milestone, um, but it's, it's only part of the process. Um, as a next step, we um, require companies to do the, the self-assessment by using the self-assessment tool that we have created within three months um, after making the commitment. And as Kokla, we, we do not have to see the results of the self-assessment. That's really up to you. We just want to encourage you to, yeah, to, to look at how you align with the principles and where you can find um, points of improvement or strengths. Um, it's just important that you send us a declaration letter. And from then on, um, yeah, we re require companies to do this annually. So on an annual basis, and again, send us the declaration letter. So that's the process. Um, let me see, I wanted to share if, um, if you do have any questions on, on this process, on how to make a commitment or, on, or how to use the self-assessment tool, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to us. We, we are, um, yeah, we can, we can help you in any way. Um, we of course hope that um, the process is, um, is quite straightforward and easy to follow, but um, if you do have any questions, um, do not hesitate to reach out. Um, yeah, then a little update on, on where we are today. We ha currently have 82 commitments and endorsements um, to the codes in place. And you can find on our website, on the consumer protection hub that we have on our Cochla website, you can find all of the companies and stakeholders that have made a commitment or an endorsement to the code. And why we do this is because we want to give this public rec recognition um, to companies that do strive to meet these, these standards of consumer protection. Um, yeah. And 
um, as a requirement to be displayed on the website, it is um, necessary to complete the self-assessment on an annual basis. So that's why we require you to send the declaration letter um, and otherwise we, yeah, we, we will not be able to give you the, the public recognition. And then your logo will be removed from the website. Um, then, yeah, we know we, we might also have some, um, some companies in the, in the room, in the virtual room that might not be offered solar providers. And we had a thought about that and we think, um, yeah, we believe that even if um, if the code was, of course, designed for off-grid solar providers, we still believe that the code is um, is is really useful for um, for other kinds of companies and business models as well. Um, so we would encourage you to to use the code as a framework and and try to see where you can maybe um, yeah tailor it to your own business. Um, and try to see if you can integrate it into your own ESMS policies. Um, then for the self-assessment tool, um, you can find it publicly on our website. So just take a look and see um, if, if you can maybe adapt some of the, um, the indicators. Some might be on, 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 um, on specific parts of the, of the Offred Solar products, but we do think there are some really overarching indicators that can be um, can be useful for any company that is in contact with com with consumers and and wants to protect them. Um, yeah, and then if you do use the self assessment tool, really try to find these strengths and these gaps, and try to see where you can find points of improvements and build these roadmaps to bring you further. And um, yeah have these benefits of, of good consumer protection. Um, yeah, then maybe a bit um, on the assessment framework, I already shared on the, the self-assessment, but just to go a little bit deeper, as I said, the commitment is only the first step. Um, so afterwards, um, we require you to do the self-assessment. Um, we currently have launched two new services as well. Um, to make um, to make the assessment even even stronger, this is um, something you can do and opt in for. So we have the third party assessment that is conducted by MFR, which is an experienced um, rating agency. And the third party assessment is a robust and independent assessment. Um, so it will include, for example, an on site visit. Um, some focus group discussions with employees, but also with customers. And um, you really get the, <clears throat> the validation on, on your performance against the principles from a third party perspective. Then on the other hand, we have the, the Lean Data Consumer Protection Survey that is undertaken by 60 Decibels, um, which is an impact measurement company. And this is a survey um, of 75 questions that was um, that were taken from the, the principles and this survey will provide you with really rich and consumer focused insight insights that again can validate your performance against the principles but then from the consumer perspective um i think i've already shared a bit on this so yeah you can find the tool on our website um the tool really, as I said, is a framework to measure, monitor, and improve um, your performance. So I think that's what we want to highlight here. It's not really something where you just tick the boxes, but we really encourage you to, yeah, to use it as something that can help you in in finding, um, yeah, finding the the strengths and gaps that you might have. And again. Um, we can give you a little demo on how the tool works. So if you do have any questions, um, please do reach out. Some short good practices on the self-assessment, what we've seen that have been has been working quite well um, so far. So it's 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 important to involve the right people. Um, as I said, it's it's not something um, at least we we hope it it will not be something that is just done at the HQ and some boxes are ticked, so it's not an individual activity, um, but it's important to 
um, yeah, to involve different teams. Maybe you operate in different regions. I mean, in 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 many countries, the situation can be totally different. So um, yeah, it's good to involve the the different teams and 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 different aspects of the company. Um, and try to find the key roles that are critical to good consumer protection. So, for example, try to to involve the the head of credit risk or or try to involve the some sales agents that do have these contacts with consumers. And then in the self-assessment tool, you can add um, evidence. Um, so supporting supporting evidence that um, that underlines why you give yourself a certain um, a certain score on a certain indicator. Um, so try to find these evidence to to make it as objective as possible. Um, and this can be indeed um, customer complaints, customer feedback, satisfaction surveys, these kinds of things. And then, as I think I emphasized already a couple of times, do build this action plan and try to see how you can get further and further um, by using this, um, this self-assessment tool and, and, and identifying the, the strengths and the gaps. And in that sense, it also helps to... Um, a point, for example, um, a consumer protection champion, someone that is really responsible for um, for all the actions that are taken, appoint an owner, a, really indicate a timeline and also resources um, to, to be able to act upon the results of, of the things that you find. Um, I see I've been talking for quite a bit, um, but maybe let's just quickly see if someone has to, um, yeah, would like to share something on um, how how the self assessment process has gone within their um, within their companies for the people that have already made a commitment or for the people that haven't. Um, how do you see that the, that the self assessment aligns with your with your internal monitoring processes? So maybe um, someone would like to share shortly something on that. Um, so everyone has uh, has been unmuted. I see Eva uh, has unmuted. So Eva, would you like to share something? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the insurance, the microcredit insurance. Uh, but uh, it was uh, happened in the past. So if it is now applied with the pay, uh, it may need uh, more research how or how it can be applicable. So in the past, uh, the bank, uh, the commercial bank like, like uh, Bank Rakyat Indonesia, they offer a microcredit to the customers uh, to buy the solar home system. And they provide the life insurance so that if the customers own, then uh, the insurance company will pay to the, to the bank, not to the customers. And, and uh, the solar home system, uh, still uh, remain with the customer. Uh, insurance is provided by the third party. In this case, uh, Rabobank at the time, they provide a partial guarantee, uh, a microcredit to the customers to purchase the solar home system. If uh, there is a default uh, in installment, then uh, the Rabobank, but then the system will be removed from the customers. So that uh, the what you call it, the solar home system will become the the collateral by the microcredit, and the rebel bank will cover uh, the default uh, installment. So I think that is the practice uh, that happened uh, in the past. But if you from uh, payment from online payment like pay as you go, so yeah, you still need to to do the research how uh, how it can be. Uh, applicable like for example every month the the installment and then uh they they cannot pay anymore then the pay as you go will yeah will will stop and then uh the insurance uh, microcredit institution so i think that's the way it is so so the customer doesn't need to know that uh they that they are covered by the insurance uh to have a, a, a credit installment default so that is uh, that is what happened in the past. So I hope it is useful for you. All right. Thank you, Eva. Thank, thank yeah. you, Eva. Thank you. All right. Uh -huh. uh, so that was a clarification on the previous discussion regarding uh, uh, risks mm -hmm. uh, for customers. Uh, 
I don't know if there's anyone on the line who'd like to mm -hmm. um, share about how the consumer protection protection code aligns with their internal processes. Okay, is there anyone? Uh, if not, I will call yeah. out someone to yeah. Um, Jack, Jack Odera, can you hear us? If you can, then uh, please respond to one of the questions that is currently being displayed on the screen. Okay, as Jack is preparing to respond, we also have Tarisai. Tarisai, who would you include in uh, in undertaking the self-assessment? Would be some of the stakeholders that you'd consider. Okay, we have a shy audience. Seems like uh, you're delivering all the points, uh, Park. <laughs> They're all understood. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, uh, if anyone would like to contribute at any point, oh, we have Teresai, sorry. Teresai, go ahead. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Teresai from Natfoot Energy, uh, currently operating in Zimbabwe. I will, I'll be answering the question, who would you include in undertaking the self-assessment? I always say it's um, pertinent or imperative to include all stakeholders starting from the bottom, because when you do this kind of assessments, people who have got uh, more feedback are the people who are using the products or people who are interact with the customers. So we'll start with the customers as number one stakeholder. Number two, the employees or the sales agents who are also involved and also partners like Google, obviously, in um, getting information on how best uh, we can assess. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much for that response. Um, I'll also invite um, Tawanda. Okay, yeah, Tawanda uh, is unmuted, so please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm, so I'm Tawanda from Regain Z7. Um, so I'll attempt the first question, you know, that it does align with our monitoring and evaluation processes. Um, because we also have a component of uh, customer satisfaction um, and uh, you know, customer sustainability, you know, looking at those points as well. Um, so as a education focused um, entity, we definitely do have, um, you know, processes that then, you know, look at uh, consumer protection um, and on access to the quality, moving the quality of education, um, giving giving the child the right to have quality education. So we do have uh, internal processes that then align with, with that whole uh, customer protection uh, process, and also um, as a way to measure, you know, um, the indebtedness of the school. Uh, when we started this uh, project, uh, you know, it's a routine that we do it every other two two years um you know where we are this this indebtedness um, we carry it uh and it, you can carry on you know and it's through um the school development committee so that uh, um if you want to call them power sponsors in our project so they are you know the ones that we then align with with that are uh, speaking to monitoring evaluation speaking to qualifying a prospect in the whole sales uh, cycle. Yeah, okay. All right, thank, thank you for that response, Standa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, would you like some more responses, Park? Um, I think we're good. We still have one more um, more part to go. So um, All right. okay. maybe we can quickly go through that um, and share some good sure. practices that we've seen. Um, Rebecca, yep. would you like to take to take over from here yes yeah um should put it in still um yeah so i think um just from what i heard there about you know bringing in the um opinions and kind of evidence from um not just kind of internal stakeholders but external stakeholders as well for the state uh, for the self-assessment is is really good um practice and and good to kind of use as much evidence and data and insights as you can as well to kind of assess your internal uh, internal practices. Um, so we we've highlighted some basic good practice that we've learnt um, 
over the last few years. So the first of one is to um, use the assessment framework to help identify the gaps um, in your, your practices um, and also the, the strengths as well. So you'll be able to kind of celebrate what you're doing well, um, but using the, the, the gaps identified to build um, an action oriented kind of roadmap um, for how you can improve. Um, number two is to integrate consumer protection across all levels of your business. So really, it's not just about something that the um, a kind of ESM manager should be focused on or an impact manager, but it's something that should be core to all of your business operations. So, you know, sales agents should be aware of um, that they should, um, you know, keep the, the customer at the center of everything they do. And the, the board should be interested in kind of customer protection KPIs. Um, and then the third one is just, yeah, using the, the, there's a lot of good practice, a lot of tools already um, identified. Um, use what's there and, and see how you can um, benefit from that to, to improve your practices as well. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so we have an example taken from uh, Sunking in Kenya. Um, their operations in Kenya. So they used the self-assessment to really kind of hold up their business practices um, with a critical eye. And they identified a number of areas where their own policies uh, could potentially show, uh, fall short if not you know, properly implemented. Um, and so the self-assessment itself sat uh, within the remit of their head of risk um, and they created an action plan um, that was, you know, kind of communicated uh, throughout the business and had um, owners of actions from across different departments. Um, and so an example of what they did here. So they, after, after doing the self-assessment, they had a look at uh, their transparency principle in particular. And they noticed that there was within their customer acquisition process, um, there was probably an area that that might increase risk to customers so the indicator of ensuring prospective customers are advised about all of the providers available products and payment options um, so they did not meet this indicator because it was likely that the sales agents were not sharing the full range of uh, payment options to the customers. Um, so the way that their commission was set up was that they um, it was easier to make a pay-as-you-go sale rather than a cash sale. But um, good practice shows that customers should be given uh, information about all of the options so that they themselves can make the informed decision about how to pay for their product. Um, so what Sunking did was add a step into the pre-sale um, stage to make sure that uh, all of the, the different payment options were communicated effectively to the customers. Um, and so that has now kind of inc improved that, um, that process and, and seen you know, better outcomes for, for Greenlight Planet and their customer. We go to the next slide. We have another example. This is from Puami, um, also in Kenya. So an SHS distribution company, and they have integrated the consumer protection code across their business. So they include it in their training for all staff um, that have a consumer facing position. Um, and they've developed different tools to make sure that it's well embedded into processes. Um, for example, you know, an onboarding checklist. So um, this is just an example um, here of the checklist that all new agents have to go through. So uh, agents are tested on, for example, the principle of transparency, what the agent should tell the customer, um, how they can confirm that the customer understands properly and such like. Um, yeah, and so when when kind of building this into training, 
it's really important to to make use of case studies in staff training, especially if you've had experiences uh, from your own customer base to really kind of make it uh, real life situations. Consider to use role plays and pop quizzes um, and carry out refresher training as well. So uh, the recommendation is to do onboarding training, but also maybe once a year, make sure that all staff that have a customer facing role um, do go through some refresher training. And again, there's there's lots of uh, information and guides on this on our website. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, we also have um, some tools such as a key fact statement. So this is, um, you know, as we all know, the pay as you go contracts can be long and um, in often written in kind of legal language that's difficult to understand, um, even for you or I sometimes. Um, and so really we want to make the main points as easy and accessible for customers as possible. Um, and so this is, is what we have here. Um, and it's a kind of template that you can use attached to the front of your contracts. And it just highlights the main information that every customer should be able to to be aware of and have it at their fingertips. Again, next slide. Um, and yeah, and as Puck mentioned earlier, there's um, kind of guidance documents on um, a growing number of the principles and, and risk areas as well. So just encourage you to go in and check that out. Um, okay. Um, I unfortunately have to drop off now to another call. So I'm going to hand back over to, to Puck, who will be able to um, hopefully handle any questions that you can have. Um, and yeah, feel free to, to ask anything or reach out to us afterwards as well. Thanks. Yeah, so um, again, if someone um, would like to share um, any tools they might have developed themselves or any good practices, feel free to unmute and share. Otherwise, if you do have any questions, um, pop them in the chat um, or, or unmute yourself and ask them um, directly to me. Hi, Papa. Um, folks are just going to... Can you hear me? Yes. So I, um, part of the practice we have in place, I can't remember all, but the ones that stuck out to me was the one of telling um, the customers, you know, um, letting them know what will happen to their systems if they fail to pay. So it's clearly stated in our, um, our contracts with customers. Then we also have the one for the warranty, which everybody knows about. Like when we get our systems, you know, it's, it's even pasted at the side of the boxes to say that, okay, we have time in for us. So I think those are part of the things we already do. And then, um, the good, good. Thank you. That's, that's great to hear. Anybody else that would like to share or anyone that has, um, has a question on, on the code, on the self-assessment or any other questions in, in general? Well, uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, yeah, this is maybe not related to the presentation today, but uh, since I'm now in the Netherlands, is that I know you are busy to prepare the event at uh, in in Rwanda. So, uh, but can you schedule a appointment to meet in Amsterdam? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm afraid not because I will leave already um, to Rwanda in, in, uh, in a couple of days. So um, I'm afraid that, that I'm not going to manage. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, so I don't have to go to Gogra uh, headquarters in Amsterdam. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't have to go to uh, Amsterdam because uh, we would like to schedule to have a meeting on the 18th uh, November next month. What do you think? Uh, 
Um, I, I don't know. You will have to reach out uh, to... That can be uh, scheduled? I, I really don't know. Um, maybe reach out to, to Kuhn or someone ah. else. Um, ah, okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> any any other questions on on the code on the workshop today? If not, um, I can hand over back to you, Dennis. Uh, yes. However, I think there's still one more poll remaining. If I'm not wrong, in the next slide, is that correct? You are right. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Um, after hearing, okay. uh, yeah, everything we've heard today, um, how strongly you all agree with the statement that says um, making a commitment to the Consumer Protection Code will help a company to fundraise. Um, so whether you agree, disagree, or maybe you're you're not yet sure. Um, all right. So. Um, I'll end the poll. So far, we have five responses. Okay, now it's six. Maybe let me just give a few more seconds in case someone is responding currently. All right, so I'll go ahead and end the poll. Uh, we have 100% agreeing with that statement, which is, a, I think, a good sign. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I also think so, and um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a good end to note on. <laughs> a good note to end on, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so maybe at this point, I think Monica is on the line. Um, I'll invite uh, Monica, if she's available, to give closing remarks. Hi. I don't think I have much to add. I think as I said, it's a really good, it's a high note to end on. Um, the agreement and it is important. Uh, I guess just to say thank you to everybody uh, for the participation and for the questions. Um, and, and I guess to reiterate that, um, feel free to reach out to Puck and uh, Rebecca on any questions that you may have on the consumer protection code. Um, and I guess also that in case you have other questions regarding other larger topics around um, ESMS and overall e-waste management, feel free also to reach out to us on the help desk at our help desk, uh, our help desk at class.ngo and we'll be um, ready to engage. And thank you again. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Buck. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, so yeah, at this point, we would like to bring the workshop to a close. I've dropped in the chat details of how to get your certificate of participation. So to help us generate that certificate, we request that you send Thank your you. name in as you'd like it to appear on the certificate and your affiliation or organization, if applicable. Uh, send those details to dmigono at class.ngo. I've dropped that in the chat in case you want to reference it. I've also shared a link to the next workshop, uh, which of course you're invited to, and we hope to see you uh, there. Uh, there being no other business uh, is to say thank you to Park and to Rebecca in absentia uh, and to my co-host Monica for making time for this session, as well as everyone who attended today uh, and everyone will be watching later on on YouTube. Uh, yeah, thank you for making time for this and see you in the next one. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks, everyone.